Myers. I work for a not-for-profit research organization called the Social Research and Demonstration Corporation. Uh, we do, uh, our mission is to uh, look at policies and programs and improve the evidence uh, uh, around policies and programs that are designed to improve the well-being of Canadians. We interpret that very broadly. Uh, we look at lots of different domains of social policy. Uh, I work primarily in the area of adult education and training and have been involved over the last few years in several uh, literacy and essential skills projects, uh, some of which we've presented at previous institutes. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, work that I conducted with a colleague, Natalie Conte, um, about social finance and the role that social finance can play in employment and training programs. Um, this is something, there is virtually no literature that addresses this type of question. There is a burgeoning literature on social finance and social innovation more broadly. We do not see a lot of research that's looked at sort of the mix of models, the mix of models that might make up the marketplace in this area. Uh, so so that's, that, that's the lens that we wanted to bring to this work. Right? So we're already starting from the premise that there's no one size fits all, there's not some magic social finance formula, but in fact there may be a number of different approaches that uh, may, may make up this transformed marketplace um, and, uh, and improve outcomes in the area of employment and training programs. So I should start by saying this work was funded by HRSDC uh, the, in the Policy Research Directorate. So it is uh, broadly looking at any type of employment and training program. So we used a number of different methodologies. Uh, we started with an environmental scan. We uh, wanted to identify organizations that were delivering employment and training services, uh, but were using some type of social finance approach. So we used a number of different techniques to do this, uh, largely going through social enterprise directories. Uh, we came up with a very long list of enterprises. Uh, we looked at the UK, Australia, Canada, and the US. Then we took that list and said, what do, these what do these initiatives have in common and where do they differ? Uh, and this is where we, we, we set out, can we identify distinct models? Are there different business models underlying these types of initiatives? Uh, and our answer that we found was yes. In fact, we identified uh, six distinct models, five of which were in operation and one which is being proposed. So then we, having those, those models identified, then we looked at, okay, what do we know about how well these models are working? Uh, what's the premise underlying these models? What types of problems do they try to solve? How do they add value? Uh, now, there wasn't a lot of literature, uh, and in some of these models, there's virtually no literature. So this, um, we had to go with expert consultations and talk with people that were directly involved in these models and, and people that, that, that are commentators in this marketplace. Uh, and we did talk to a number of those. The final thing we did was we thought, okay, now that we've got a set of models, some benefits, we thought we would run it by uh, stakeholders. So we, the province of Manitoba, uh, graciously offered to set up round tables for us. So we, uh, we did two round tables, one with senior policy uh, policy makers uh, in a, a couple of different ministries, ministries that oversee social assistance, employment training programs, uh, um, entrepreneurship and trade and so on. So we had ABMs and uh, deputy ministers, directors and so on uh, for a very well attended session. So I can share a little bit of our, our findings from that session. The next day we talked with the executive directors from uh, training and employment um, organizations. So we had about 25 executive directors in the room. So the angle that we, we, we took for this was what, to what extent can social finance solve challenges or long-standing problems? We heard Siobhan talk about uh, sort of growing awareness that we have not done as much as we theoretically should be able to do around solving complex problems. So we, we started, what problem are we trying to solve? So in the context of employment and training programs, there's been increasing consensus that one of the one of the limitations of programs is their supply side focus. We're, we're training people and preparing people, uh, but not necessarily with a clear connection or clear sense for what job, for what employers, in what labor market. 
Um, and so a number of reports have come out recommending a shift to a more demand side focus, or uh, as many people say, a dual customer focus. One that serves job seekers, but also employers. Because we don't have employers and we don't have jobs. So how can we align the demand and supply side and make them more effective? Uh, one of the most definitive statements of that was the Leach Report that came out of the UK and uh, something that governments uh, in uh, Canada, the US, uh, Australia all paid attention to. Uh, so that became part of our question, to what extent can these models uh, shift the focus to a more demand uh, side and, uh, and to what extent does that make a difference? Um, before I go there, a couple of words, what is social finance? So I don't know how many people in the room feel confident that they can describe what social finance is. It's, um, it is a number of different things and uh, not easy to do justice. I think that could be the entire subject of a presentation. Um, I will just make a couple of brief remarks uh, that for investors, it's an opportunity to, uh, I think one of the sayings that uh, has been coined is, uh, to do well, well while doing good, right? So investors are interested in initiatives that have either a double bottom line or a triple bottom line if it's including environmental impacts. <coughs> and um, I'll talk just a little bit about who those investors might be. Um, uh, for entrepreneurs, uh, social finance is an opportunity to have additional revenue streams without the usual constraints around government funding. So uh, social finance is an opportunity to direct funds where it needs to be directed most. Uh, governments are interested in social finance to, uh, as, as a means to stimulate innovation, to bring new ways of thinking about long-standing complex challenges, um, our, our sense certainly is that would be something that would be shared by actors on the not-for-profit side, something that would be welcome. Um, the other piece, particularly for nonprofits, is around generating revenue. Uh, some models do this much more effectively than others, and we'll see that in some cases that's not at all the purpose of models, but, but that's one piece of it. Uh, for governments, transferring risk is a key piece of this. Uh, Siobhan talked about governments being risk-averse. Uh, and about governments need to take more risks, uh, but governments, I, I think really the key is around sharing risk. It's around aligning incentives so that um, those who take risks uh, are rewarded, but everyone is working towards the same goals. So that, 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 that's really a real piece of the potential for social finance, um, given our sense of the models that we've seen. Um, and then the last piece is generating savings. Um, and again, this, this, this is more of a feature of some models. Than Very high level look at the social finance marketplace. The social finance marketplace, like any marketplace, is made up of actors on the demand side who um, have a need for social finance, and my side that supply social finance. Uh, uh, Siobhan also mentioned that uh, there are some real innovations on the supply side um, and in fact uh, there is about to launch a, an actual social ventures index. So and the Mars Center for so, uh, Impact Investing is, is the, the um, they're, they're the stakeholders that are um, sort of making much of this happen across Canada. Uh, there are a number of intermediaries that, um, that are involved in social finance, much more well developed around environmental or um, um, energy related uh, projects than social projects, but it's starting to happen in uh, the social marketplace. And, and, and much more than we would realize from looking just at literacy and essential skills activities. Uh, someone asked a question about the types of instruments. I, I won't have time to go in these. Social impact bonds are not fixed income. They're more akin to a quasi-equity tool, and if anyone wants to ask me questions about those, uh, I can take questions afterwards, but won't um, talk about it in the presentation. So let me go to our key findings. Uh, first, uh, there are a number of social finance uh, initiatives and employment and training programs. 
Uh, we identify five uh, currently in play, plus one being proposed. Uh, to varying degrees, all models deliver on this promise uh, in terms of what social innovation can offer. They do so in different ways, with different limitations. Um, but we were particularly struck by the extent to which they all seem designed to address this demand side problem. They, they, they're, they're, they're well set up uh, to do that, uh, and I think in part because the mobilization of capital is something that has natural appeal to employers. So they kind of work, uh, they work well together. And this is sort of, I don't know if this is an obvious point, uh, but maybe to contrast to an area like child protection. Um, so if we are talking about Children's Aid Society and keeping children with their families, um, uh, uh, this is not an area where you're gonna see a market approach work well. Right, this is an area, and what we have seen is the use of social impact bonds in this area to create a synthetic market because there's, there's a real clear understanding that an actual market is inappropriate, right? These are not services that under any circumstances could be commercialized, right? So um, in an effort to try alternative financing, there is a need to create a synthetic market because a real one is unacceptable. In the case of employment and training programs, our research has suggested that that's just not the case, right? That there is a market um, and we see some models that are already in play that have tapped into that market. So I'll go through each of these models. It's going to need to be fairly quick, quickly, uh, but I'll try to cover all of them at least in some detail so you have a sense of what they are. Uh, the first model is the employment model. And this is the model that we heard about in um, a, a real life, uh, fantastic example of Stella's Circle. Um, Stella's Circle epitomizes this model. Uh, it, uh, the, under this model, the agency develops enterprises that employ the target population. There, there are just there are hundreds, thousands of these probably operating across the U.S. We saw just in the example of that Catalyst Kitchen that there are, I don't know whether, maybe 50 uh, of those operating alone. So just a very specific type of cafe, there are at least 50 operating in the US. So this is a very common model. We have some that operate on an extremely large scale. Pioneer Human Services in Seattle has about 25 million in uh, revenues that come from their enterprises. Uh, so, uh, Goodwill is also another example. Goodwill operates globally, uh, generates uh, revenues also uh, well into the millions, and employs large numbers, thousands and thousands of individuals. So this is a fairly tried and true, uh, or whatever that expression is. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean. So, so this model, and in fact, I think Goodwill started this model in the late 1800s, and it's it most closely connected to the history of social enterprise. Um, we have examples in the example span, wide range of target populations, uh, but what they all have in common, this is a model for multi-barriered individuals. This is a model for individuals that would not succeed in the labor market as is. So this, um, usually the goal is to ladder or bridge individuals to the labor market, and this can be done uh, more successfully for some populations than others. So Pioneer Human Services serves largely um, ex-prisoners that are integrating into society, and their goal is to have individuals working in the mainstream labor market within a year. So that may be too short a time period for some populations, um, uh, but others may be able to do this more quickly. So, but it, but it, it is very much focused on individuals with multi-barriers. The second model that we see in operation is what we call a fee-for-service model. Um, so we see this both on employment services side as well on, as on the training side. So this is a model, uh, uh, alternative staffing agencies is the most common model here. Um, this is where agencies, not-for-profit agencies, take on the role of, of a temp agency or an employment services agency. So 
in some ways they're doing what they were always doing, uh, but with a different funding structure, di a different set of incentives, and very strongly with a dual customer focus. So instead of uh, paying employers to, to um, hire individuals through wage sub subsidies and other forms of paying employers, it's actually flipped around and uh, the model is engaging employers and um, telling employers, we can meet your needs. We can give you good, high quality, well-trained individuals for your entry level positions. Um, but if we do that and you are satisfied, you pay us. So rather than paying employers to, uh, to take people uh, through wage subsidies, almost signaling that, you know, we have people, but we don't really know if they're any good, right? So help us out, take them on a wage subsidy, and then we all know what happens, the wage subsidy ends, and, uh, you know, that uh, individual's back where they started in many cases. So this is saying, okay, well, how can we actually meet your needs as an employer? What would you need from individuals? So here, training is absolutely critical. This is where the essential skills training comes in in a significant way. So we came across, I, I think the number is about um, 75, do I have that on? I think there's 75 to 100 alternative staffing agencies in the US currently, um, all using this fee-for-service model. There's one in Canada. It's called Ember Staffing Solutions, and it operates in British Columbia. Um, and uh, it is connected to a not-for-profit organization uh, that works in, um, in the Lower East Side, um, as, as well as in other area, every areas of the mainland. Uh, it's the only model we came across, that to, uh, or staffing agency model in Canada. Uh, it was launched a couple of years ago. It, it's on its way to being profitable. It's getting close to breaking even from what I understand. Um, um, but it has borrowed from these US models as well too. Um, so training providers also use fee-for-service to some extent, uh, and I think that that's um, uh, an interesting conversation for us here today. Um, who has tried that? Who is interested in trying that? Under what conditions could something like that work? Uh, Linda also pointed out to me this morning that um, even agencies that do not, under any circumstances, charge a fee for their training services may charge a fee for their consulting services. They may, they may do consulting, drawing on their expertise that they have from doing the work that they do. So that's an, another potential uh, variant on the fee for service. But that would be different than the core business model um, that, that you operate under being fee for service. The third model that we saw, and this was a model that um, we, we only saw one application of, but um, was used in a, in a reasonably large scale, and, and it's quite interesting, so I, I think it's worth bringing forward. This is a model that was created by Social Capital Partners, um, and under this model, Social Capital Partners, they're a not-for-profit organization, they, um, uh, who is interested in improving outcomes in employment and training programs, that's their mission. Um, they said, they understood that uh, individuals that wanted to buy franchises needed capital. And so they took that need and said, hmm, they also need entry level people. If they're starting a business, they need money, they need people. So how could we incentivize uh, how could we incentivize the franchise owners to hire individuals who uh, have employment barriers or had employment barriers but are ready to work now? Uh, so their innovation was to offer low-cost financing, a lot, uh, offer debt financing at an attractive uh, interest rate, but tied to uh, tied to the franchise. Off, uh, hiring a certain proportion of individuals. So they partner with um, community agencies that offer employment services. They work together in partnership with the franchises, with the employment services agency, to identify and select individuals, prepare them through training um, to work in the franchises. So that's been a very successful program that um, 
is in use with a number of franchises in Ontario and is expanding. It's an active in Ross, a couple of restaurants, um, and, and so on. So uh, we like this model because uh, of its notion of sort of, we were initially calling this the quid pro quo uh, model, right? That it's, it's you know, it, it is really about aligning needs and incentives. Let me say that the first three models are all models that are used by not-for-profit organizations, whether those organizations are charities, co-ops, or, um, or just not-for-profit um, organizations. Um, the, the fourth model um, is, is a business model. So these are um, organizations that are for-profit. Um, they are for-profit, but they have a, a double bottom line. Uh, they, they, um, they achieve their social goals through commercial means. And we only found two examples uh, of this model. So the first is Allison. It's an online uh, learning model. Has anyone ever heard of this? So there, there was a large New York Times article about this model. I hadn't heard of it until this year either, but they have um, well over a million learners each year. Uh, they're not, all of their courses are free. They have several hundred uh, high quality courses, uh, courses that, are, uh, that lead to certifications recognized by employers and so on. Um, their model works uh, because of what people refer to as the long tail of the internet. Right, so they can offer highly specialized training programs, but because they reach so many people at such a low cost through the internet, right, that um, all of the programs are free and their model works on, um, um, on ad revenue. We, we, didn't, we had trouble sort of seeing how this model could translate um, into um, a, a model for um, learners with um, we're doing literacy and essential skills challenges, but it, you know it's certainly interesting. Um, the, there are a few of the social enterprises that operate, like Turnaround Couriers is one example that operates. It's a for-profit um, business. It's a, a courier business also started by social capital partners that operates in Toronto. Um, it's rare that these social enterprises are actually for-profit social enterprises. Um, almost everyone we came across was not for profit. Uh, the fifth model, this is the, um, we use the broader term, pay for success, uh, but the, 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 the most uh, compelling example within this are the social impact bonds. Um, our, so in our research, and we talk about this a, a fair bit of length in our paper, there are actually numerous variants on the social impact uh, bond model. Um, some are quasi, most are quasi equity, but there are, there is in fact one that we came across that's more like a fixed income traditional bond. Um, the premise of these models is the government uh, working with stakeholders identifies program interventions um, that if implemented, uh, to, implemented in a way that, that meets the wide range of needs that individuals have, so if in, implemented uh, properly according to uh, what we understand works for the target population, will generate downstream savings for the government. So that, that's a key piece. If you don't have that piece, then you don't have the uh, entry uh, conditions to doing a social impact bond. So you have to identify an intervention that um, is effective enough in ways that actually will lead to savings. Um, if you don't have that, then you need some other financing model because bonds work uh, with a, um, attracting a private investor, whether that investor is a foundation, uh, whether that investor in the New York example is Goldman Sachs, um, um, or whether it is, um, there, there are some other examples of sort of quasi or hybrid foundations and other players involved. Um, they, uh, the private investor, does the upfront financing, uh, only gets the, the, uh, their money back 
if the intervention is successful in achieving the outcomes that will generate that savings. So the private investors need to be convinced that the intervention will work. That the providers not only have we got the right intervention, but we've got the right providers. And we've got all of the other conditions in place that lead to success. Right? So investors get convinced that this is something that will work. They invest the money. Government pays for success, but also shares a portion of that casual savings um, with the investors. Um, providers are often incentivized through paying for their performance. So that is one of the tools to, to, to do this process of aligning incentives. So the last model is one um, that, that, that there have been some sort of small scale uh, pilots, but is being proposed as a way of just taking some of the best of these uh, models around aligning uh, needs and incentives, but just directly negotiating partnerships. Uh, bringing government, uh, private, private sector, service providers uh, to the table and saying how can we make this work in our region. So all parties contribute, all parties shape the intervention, and all parties benefit. Right? So it's, it's just it's, it's, um, an alternative fi financing model. You have um, additional contributions that you didn't have, particularly from the employers, but the financing is negotiated uh, in the room, on the table, and it may look different in different places. So it's really taking the best of the social financing um, insights uh, but using a more flexible, so it's not a one-size-fits-all model. So just to uh, recap in terms of how each of these models uh, addresses that long-standing problem around how to create a more demand-focused system, how to ensure that we're preparing individuals for jobs that actually exist in the labor market. First model, the employment model, uh, the problem is solved perhaps most eloquently and most efficiently uh, by having the provider and employer be one and the same. Uh, uh, what we know from this model is it's intended to be a ladder to the mainstream labor market. Um, and, and the target is really very multivariate individuals. The fee-for-service model uh, aligns uh, or brings this more demand focus uh, by commercializing its services. By, by now requiring employers to pay, you have, uh, again, immediate and very clear incentives to um, deliver a service that's needed and valued in the marketplace. Um, uh, and we'll talk about some of the challenges that this model has. Uh, in the financial incentive model, incentives are aligned around, uh, around the loan. Employers don't have to pay back the loan if they're not fully satisfied with the individuals that they receive. So this is um, a rather high stakes model. Again, you have to be confident that you have an intervention and you know how to prepare people for, for the jobs in question. Uh, this, the the for-profit model um, is it, just purely a market model. Um, and again, not a very common model. I think that's a really important piece when we talk about this marketplace. This marketplace is not uh, a purely private sector marketplace, and in fact, we only found two examples uh, of uh, that operate in Canada. When you know hundreds uh, of these more hybrid um, uh, public-private partnership models, um, and then the last in the pay for success financing, it's simply all around outcomes uh, for all payers. Uh, their their compensation or their return um, is staked around outcomes. So challenges, lots of challenges. We did not come across anyone who saw this as easy. Um, and the key piece is you need to be an entrepreneur. Not everyone is an entrepreneur. Uh, most small businesses fail. So we are talking about uh, high transaction costs and significant risk. Uh, so this is not going to solve all of our problems. Uh, you can really see someone talked about joy yesterday. 
this is what makes people tick to do this kind of thing. So they're, they're for the right people, this is a fantastic uh, way. And, and real for those of you who um, have no intention of ever doing this, um, what people who do do this bring is recycling of capital, right? So if they can do this by mobilizing additional capital, that's more capital that's available for traditional funding streams. So that's sort of where they fit in, um, in a world of people that don't plan on doing this, but plan on delivering services. So it's about making the most efficient use of capital. If there's capital on the table and people that can mobilize it, they do that, that puts more capital into the system. Um, I think we're gonna talk about this this afternoon. So I won't say too much other than to emphasize all models face a constant ongoing balancing of social and financial goals. So just briefly to give an example from Inner City Ren Renovations, which is a construction company that was started because as private sector construction companies started to do projects in inner city Winnipeg, they would get things started up, they would get vandalized, torn down, um, Governments would put in increasingly tighter and tougher rules and they were just, nothing was working to get infrastructure programs off the ground. Someone had the brilliant idea, what if we involved the community? What if we hired people in the community to work in this re renovation enterprise? That's what they did. Um, they got it off the ground, then they figured this is actually very difficult because we're no longer talking entry level jobs. We're talking about semi-skilled, there were laborers, but also semi-skilled trades. How do we train, prepare individuals to work in this business and actually deliver a high quality product? Uh, so their story, which you can read about, was you know that constant balancing. After five years, they generate enough re revenue to cover the cost, and they hire 60% Aboriginals that live in inner city Winnipeg. So they've done, I think, quite an exceptional job, but they're never finished in terms of that balancing. So I think that will be really interesting to hear about this afternoon. Um, lots of challenges in terms of how we would do this with the existing funding structures and regulatory environment and so on. So uh, I don't think we're really, uh, Siobhan talked about some work that's been done within the federal government around how to do this. I think this is really still emerging. So I'll leave it there.